You're listening to Oh My Health, There Is Hope podcast. When your heart is aching and your world is shaking, don't give up. No, no, don't give up. Hello and welcome to Oh My Health, There Is Hope podcast. I'm your host, Jana Short. And today I'm here with Lisa Wisnett. Lisa is a pelvic health occupational therapist who is passionate about treating those patients suffering suffering from pelvic pain and also loves serving the pregnant and postpartum population. Her background practicing in multiple occupational therapy environments provides an innovative approach to therapy, extensive knowledge of self-care methods and proficiency in mental health practices. Lisa found her passion for pelvic health after the birth of her daughter and her own diagnosis with endometriosis. She understands that experiencing the experiencing of having pelvic issues and working to be an advocate for her patients, providing a holistic approach to healing. By the way, there are so many women that suffer from this. And even those who haven't had babies, like literally have issues with this and they don't know what to do about it. So I'm so glad that you're here today, Lisa. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Dana. One of the things I'm excited excited to have you here. One of the things we do with all of our guests (laughs) is we ask them to share a story of hope because I believe like you talk right away about your story leading you here. And I think those journeys are gifted to us for a very unique reason so that we can share them and help others that are experiencing, you know, what we've gone through. So why don't you start us off by sharing your story of hope? Okay, great. Yeah. So, um, kind of starting off since puberty, I've had long and painful periods. I mean, I would be sitting on the couch in fetal position for my first few days of my cycle. Um, and you know, it was already talked about like that was normal pain periods were painful. It was just kind of commonplace. So I really didn't even know enough about it at the time. Um, fast forward several years, you know, I just kind of learned to deal with it and manage it. And then after I had my daughter, my symptoms actually got worse. They started to affect my bladders and my bowel and it just, the pain got so severe. It was affecting me on a daily basis. Um, I had been to a little bit of pelvic floor therapy at this point. So I knew what it was. Um, I'd been practicing as an OT for several years. So I was at least comfortable in the clinical setting and understanding, but I was like, okay, I think something's going on with me. Like this can't be normal. (laughs) I shouldn't have to live my life this way. You know, I'm, trying to work. I'm trying to take care of my daughter. Um, there's gotta be more to it. And so I actually kind of just started doing my own research. Um, I found a bunch of Facebook groups that are related to endometriosis and found out, Oh my gosh, okay. This kind of sounds like what I have. I didn't know for sure, but, um, all these wonderful support groups and women just sharing their stories about it. Um, so I kind of went down the rabbit hole almost with learning all that information and knowledge. And I found myself kind of a specialist in my area who deal, dealt with endometriosis. And so I made an appointment with her and she's like, yeah, I definitely think you got it, but let's, let's run all these tests. But the only way to officially confirm it is with a surgery, um, and making sure and going in and scoping, looking at the tissue and even taking it out. So, um, that's what I did. I was like, I'm so ready do whatever you need to do. I I need to get better. Like I I can't live like this anymore. Um, and so we did the surgery and while that was kind of a challenging rehab, I did therapy afterwards and everything. It really, really, I got so much better. (laughs) I didn't have all the issues I was having anymore. Um, and I'm just kind of like living proof that while there is no cure for, for endo at this time, um, You can get better. You can learn how to manage it with therapy, lifestyle, diet changes, all those big things play a role in it. And I mean, my surgery, I think was about three years ago or so, and I'm still doing good. I'm still doing better than I ever was beforehand. So that's uh, kind of it in a nutshell. I know that was. I love that people are literally trying to like, they're, it's like, it's this new thing and nobody ever heard of it, but women were suffering with it for years and years, probably since the beginning of time. Oh, yeah. And they would just tell you like, that's oh, just yeah. a cycle. You just have hard cycles, but can you maybe put it in a nutshell for those women who maybe have not heard the term endometriosis? Can you put in a little nutshell what that is and what the symptoms might feel like? 
Yeah, definitely. So they're still doing a lot of research on it. They're not sure what is causing endometriosis, but basically it, it's looking like it's tissue that is similar to the lining of the uterus that grows for whatever reason outside the uterus. So in the pelvic abdominal cavity, they find it in the lungs sometimes. I mean, it can kind of spread anywhere throughout the body. Um, they do think there's a genetic component with it. They've noticed a lot of like maternal lines that have had similar symptoms. Um, but what some of the symptoms can be um, pain with sex, painful periods, um, difficulty with urinating or having bowel movements, um, even pain can be associated with those. Um, I have women that have pain kind of almost on a daily basis. It's not just when they're on their period. Um, it's kind of throughout the whole cycle. But it tends to be a lot on those period days because it grows its own progesterone and estrogen. So it moves with the cycle. It affects with that. Um, a lot of times, kind of some of the less known ones are um, fatigue. Um, a lot of these women are just like exhausted just from the pain in general, but it really just kind of takes that out of you. Um, and sometimes there can be triggers from food associated with it. So certain foods can be irritating those tissues even more. So I know that? another, mm -hmm. that was beautiful, by the way. Um, I think another thing that women don't put together is how does the pelvic floor help with that? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Great question. So basically with years of pain and everything that has gone on with endometriosis, however long it's going on, uh, gone on, it's affected the pelvic floor. The pelvic floor muscles literally support those organs, the bladder, the rectum and the uterus, all, the, all those systems. And so with time, with pain, those muscles contract and they get angry and they get short and tight and they can make those pain systems work. Or worse, I'm sorry, they can make the pain worse. Um, just like every other muscle in our body needs to be able to have full range of motion, that's the same thing with our pelvic floor. So when they get tight and stuck, they're not getting that range of motion they need and can make all those symptoms worse. I mean, I have some women that haven't even had babies that um, have been leaking urine for a long time with either daily life or exercise and things like that. And it's from the it can be from that um, muscle tension down in the pelvic floor. Wow, that's crazy. And, and here's the thing, when I grew up, I grew up like, I still think it was like caveman days when I was delivering babies. My, my baby's in his 30s, and my oldest is going to be 43 next month. So it was a different time than now, which I love that they're going back to more natural ways of having your babies. But the first thing they told me when I went for my very first pregnancy check was to start using Kegel muscles to help. It helps with your, your delivery. And all I ever knew about was a Kegel muscle. I did not know there was so much more going on in my pelvic region that I could be, you know, focusing in on to help me. Like you take care of your, your gut, right? You take care of your head. We're taking care of our skin. And, but we forget things that are super important that we are going to need <laughs> for the rest of our lives. What are some right. of the things you help your clients do to help like connect to all the things that they should be taking care of as far as the pelvic floor goes. Right. So really foundation for pelvic floor therapy. And I really start everybody on this, whether regardless of their symptoms, but especially my, my endo patients, my pelvic pain patients, we focus on breathing because the pelvic floor moves with our breath. And if we're not breathing properly, then your pelvic floor is not moving properly either. Um, especially a lot of my pelvic pain cli clients, they are chest breathers. And so they're not getting that mobility through their core and everything that they need. So that's, that's step one. <laughs> we focus on good um, diaphragmatic breathing, um, kind of increasing awareness of what the pelvic floor is. I mean, we all know where our arms and legs are, but when someone mentions pelvic floor, they're like, I don't even know what that is. Um, so just creating some awareness, um, body awareness around that. Um, I go over a lot of pelvic floor relaxation techniques, um, and sometimes I use a little bit of equipment, um, things like dilators or wands, to help slowly stretch and relax the pelvic floor. Um, and it also helps the patient because they get more comfortable. They're like, okay, my body's okay. It's not broken. Like, I'm going to get better doing these things. Um, so, and then, you know, if depending on their symptoms uh, with bowel and bladder stuff, we'll go over positionings and healthy ways to have bowel movements and how often I really should be peeing and kind of what's normal, not normal. So working on those habits in their daily routine as well. 
I absolutely love all of those amazing tips that you shared. But are there some things women can be doing at home? <laughs> Like when, for instance, you say you work with um, pregnant women and post-pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that my pelvic floor, I had my, my first daughter very young. And I remember thinking, what happened to my body? Because I could feel that there was a shift mm -hmm. and a change. But you didn't ask your doctor. They're like, that's normal. You had a baby. <laughs> and they never told you how to snap. <laughs> I mean, it never goes back the same. I'm telling you, ladies, it never goes back the same. But there's no reason it can't be close to or sometimes even better because you weren't paying attention to it to begin with. So what are some of the things that maybe right. they can do at home before it gets so that, bad that they're, you know, in so much pain? Right, 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 right. Um, so really, I'm going to come back to the breathing. That's, feel, that's what I feel like I talk about is breathing properly. So what you're kind of looking for is that your rib cage is moving kind of 360 degrees. And your belly is going to be kind of moving at the same time. So it's going to be like 50% your rib cage, 50% your belly. You don't want your chest moving a whole lot. And I literally give exercises where my patient is on the floor with the band or something around their rib cage to practice breathing. Um, another thing to kind of look at is um, when you're engaging your core and when you're engaging your pelvic floor. So I have my patients do a lot of engagement when they're exhaling through an exercise and then inhaling and relaxing everything um, on the exercise. And that can sometimes get a little tricky. Um, as women, we're told to like suck it in and hold things in a lot. So a lot of us are constantly gripping and clenching our abs when we really should let them go and relax as well. Um, so if you do that, if you feel like you're always sucking in, relax on that. And then also making sure you're always breathing. When we breath hold, it causes a lot of stress in our core and pelvic floor and can exacerbate his symptoms too. So those are very basic, but kind of just a couple of things to really focus on and getting to know your body better as well. So Lisa, those are super basic. And when people hear like, it can't be as simple as that. Uh, think of any of you who've had a baby, what's the first thing they teach you to do? Breathe. Like if you're not breathing and uh, focusing in on that breath, like I had literally four children, not one piece of pain medication mm -hmm. on board. Not that I was going to not get it, but I kept thinking I could get through one more. I could get through one more. And I got myself through to having a baby because of the breathing techniques mm -hmm. I was taught. So, and I saw, this is like the most incredible thing. I have a five-year-old granddaughter and she hurt herself really bad falling mm -hmm. off her scooter. And while her mom's fixing her, they were videotaping her because she was just so dang cute hurt. <laughs> but anyways, she says, oh, oh, it hurts. And she goes, breathe, breathe, because she was holding her breath. And she knew, she just knew uh -huh. to take it. And she does this on video. I'm like, how do little five-year-olds know to do this when we hold our breath when we're yeah. asking? We like hold it in. We like stiffen mm -hmm. up instead of relaxing and trying to help the body, you know, through it. So I think those may seem super right. simple and basic, but they are so powerful. They're free. You can breathe all you want. It's free. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and doing breath work, I'm telling you, it is incredible. The first breath work class I had, Lisa, like I was like, I've been breathing since the day I was born. I'm like pretty sure I'm doing it. I'm still here. But I went to this breath work right. instructor and I was like, what the heck was that? Like I walked out and I felt <laughs> immediately surged with energy. Like it was the weirdest yeah. thing. How could I have not been breathing correctly? the whole time. And you have, you do have to think about it as you're learning this process to reset your mind to not shallow breathe, not chest breathe, and to like really pull that air in. But it does. It, what other benefits mm -hmm. do you find as an occupational therapist that just proper breath work or breathing techniques helps with? Mm -hmm. So definitely everything you just mentioned, like it, it gives you more energy, you feel better. Um, and especially with particularly speaking to my chronic pain patients, it helps really reduce stress. Um, just taking time for yourself, shutting everything off, you're just not gonna feel that anxiety that comes with it. Um, on top of all the benefits with pelvic floor and just breathing and emotion and everything, when I teach my, my moms or my patients to engage correctly, I was talking about engaging your pelvic floor and kind of your low abs at the same time, you can get stronger. Um, I tell my moms, because I see moms as early as two weeks postpartum, like, 
hey, even if you just focus on your breathing and exhale when you pick your kid up, you're going to feel stronger. Even if you like can't get to the exercises, I give you anything like that. And they do, they get so much better. And even like their symptoms get reduced from just breathing and engaging their core and pelvic floor at the right times. I mean, it's, it's so basic, but it's so amazing <laughs> to see that it works. You know, we're not taught how to breathe properly. I mean, it's so automatic for us, but we really have to retrain our bodies, especially after um, having a baby or being pregnant and um, after surgeries, pain, things like that. It's so important to focus on. I, for all you new moms who have brand new babies, <laughs> and you're, like you don't want them to cry because they're hurt, they're in pain, they need something. I was raised with a family of doctors and they're like crying for your baby is one of the best things it can do for itself. It's cleaning out its lungs, it's you know, pushing its blood flow through, getting oxygen to its newly developing brain, right? And they're like, let right. me cry for a while is really good for them. Um, especially mm -hmm. if preemies, like they love it when pre preemies are crying. They love it. Right. Like that, yeah. that's a good thing. Like they're, 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 that's their way of healing and sucking in all that air that they're doing when they're crying. So it's right. a good thing for the babies to do. And they kind of instinctively mm -hmm. already know that. I want to start talking about um, the women you work with. Like, I know that most people who are listening to this right now think, oh, this pre, you know, baby stage post, just right post baby stage, but taking care of your pelvic floor, like I'm in my sixties, taking care of your pelvic floor is for every age. And there's so many other things that happen when you don't like women who have, um, they're a little incontinent because they weren't able to take care of their pelvic floor or when they go through the, their change of life and they become post, you know, hormonal and all this other amazing stuff that's happening to our bodies as we age, taking care of our pelvic floor, learning those beautiful breathing techniques really will soften that blow for you <laughs> per se. So what yeah. kind of women, like what age groups, like tell us, obviously it's good for pre having a baby, right? It prepares <laughs> our bodies and all those techniques. It's good post having a baby, but tell us some of the benefits for people that are older. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so I do work with like pre or post menopausal women as well, because that's when that, you know, your hormones are changing, you're not producing as much estrogens. And like you mentioned, incontinence is a big piece of it. So honestly, I kind of work on the same take system. It's just a little bit different because a lot of times they're dealing with like vaginal dryness, which can make sex painful. They may be having some disruption in the bowel and bladder stuff as well. So really, um, I kind of look at treating them the same. We just might have to tweak some things hormonally. Um, there's been a lot of research and a lot of helpful benefits with like um, a localized vaginal estrogen for women who are menopausal, which they can get a prescription from their um, provider and everything for. Um, and so still just same working on those, those same techniques and everything and making sure that they're getting the good mobility and can control their bladder and those types of things. <laughs> I love that when I was um, younger, I didn't, I've never been a person who liked to work out, but I, when I saw yoga, I'm like, mm -hmm. I can do that. They're like, they're not really working up as well. <laughs> but I mm -hmm. yoga was one of the hardest workouts I've ever done. And I love it because it's so good for core muscles. It's so good for core muscles. And mm -hmm. I don't, every time I go to a yoga class and I'm looking at the elderly women around me, my age, you know, they look have been awesome and they're like yeah i've done yoga almost all my life they just it's amazing so if you're thinking like i don't want to be at a gym working out or yoga is so amazing you could do it at home i do mine at home since covid and it's just mm -hmm. been it's an amazing experience and it's great for breath work because you have to breathe through some of those positions like or you won't be able to stay in them all right exactly and i incorporate a lot of yoga and Pilates poses in my work because I love the breath work. I love the movement. I pair the movement with the breathing. I mean, it's, there's so many benefits for it. Definitely. And I find a lot of people, even if they don't, like you said, like don't like to work out and hit heavy at the gym, like that's a great alternative for them. Um, on the other end of that though, I do see women that like train in CrossFit and are big time runners. And so we just kind of change our treatment plan to gear them into preparing for that and everything and not having those symptoms when they're exercising. So I know we talk about endometriosis, but working your pelvic floor, like we said a little earlier, is for everybody. So for instance, I literally pay attention to mine because I had a problem. It seems like you don't pay attention until there's a problem. And, so, and then that's your wake up call. But I'm hoping all of you don't wait for the wake up call because literally how much time do you think you have to spend on keeping a healthy pelvic floor? 
I mean, once you get the basics down, you kind of see the pattern of it. I mean, d on an average, I may see my patients for five visits, just depending. I mean, obviously I have my chronic patients that I work with more long-term, but some moms I see postpartum, they've got three visits, they're doing great. We're getting them back on their program. I mean, it really just depends. It's very individualized, but I mean, once you get kind of the basics down, you can, you can run with it. <laughs> Hey, it's not a lot of time. It's not like you're thinking, oh, I got to add another thing in because I got to pay attention mm -hmm. to my pelvic floor. I had to have a hysterectomy because I um, tested positive for the BRCA gene. And because of my family history, I okay. chose to be proactive and to mm -hmm. um, have a hysterectomy in my 50s, early 50s. And they told mm -hmm. me, oh my goodness, it's going to be horrible because you're going to go to menopause early. And, it was not because I was prepared. I was prepared with my breath work. I was prepared with paying attention to my pelvic floor. I was prepared. And honestly, I don't want to brag about it, but it was easy. Like it was the easiest thing I ever did. Recovering from the surgery the first few days was the hardest part. None of that happened. I don't like, again, I don't want to brag, but it literally is five, 10 minutes a day that I pay attention consciously. And I do have to sometimes, especially as you get tired, especially I'm at a desk all day doing podcasts and interviews. And I notice on camera, I start slunching in and I not breathe because <laughs> you're tired. And as soon as I see that, I'm like, nope, I sit back up, start taking in some really nice belly breaths and remember mm -hmm. it like triggers a memory that I need to be paying attention, gets me through the rest of the day. So I right. love your tips. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, hey, brag away. I think women need to know like these things don't have to be terrible and you don't have to be in pain all the time. So I love that. I love how prepared you were. That's fantastic. And with endometriosis, am I wrong? Or is that one of the things I keep hearing that's causing a lot of inter infertility in women? It definitely can. There's a percentage of women that are, that can, that it can cause infertility with not, not everyone. I think sometimes people, when they get that endo scare, they get nervous that, oh my gosh, I can't have kids if they were wanting to have some, but, um, it's not, it's not like a death sentence for that. There definitely is a percentage, um, especially it depends on the severity of how, uh, of the endo, like where it, what organs it has attached to. So if it's really hiding around your, your reproductive organs and you get what kind of turned a frozen pelvis, then that can limit a lot of that. Um, but therapy is great for that too, for fertility reasons. We do a lot of visceral work and abdominal work to kind of break up adhesions or, or, and try to mobilize the tissues around it. Not that I can break up into adhesions, but just trying to get things flowing, get blood flow to the area to work towards that fertility. So there's hope. There's always hope. That's what this whole story is about. Uh, this whole show is my, oh, my health. There is hope. There always is hope. And so if you're struggling with that, I want you guys to connect with Lisa. Um, do you do any kind of work online or is it all clinically based that you have to be in there? No, I do offer telehealth um, and we can definitely do like, I mean, I, I'm located in Texas, but kind of wellness type uh, consult visits um anywhere else but yeah um i do um yeah i do do telehealth as well <laughs> to answer your question so that is amazing so you guys can reach out to her and connect with her slip into her dm send her a message and if you have questions book some time with her because you shouldn't be living in pain like you really shouldn't life is just too beautiful you don't want every time you have a cycle to be miserable or you're like you literally are on your cycle for five days and you're two weeks worrying about it and like it's, it's coming. I know it is. I'm starting to feel that pain and I feel that inflammation. There's so many things that you can do both holistically and clinically that will free you from that constant pain. You don't want to live like that anymore. Um, I, I know that we haven't talked at all about diet, but I will tell women that changing your diet to something less inflammatory will absolutely help with this. It was a game changer for me like removing things that were very inflammatory to my body. I noticed that it, I felt a lot better. Right. Yeah, definitely. And for things like endo and like a painful bladder sy symptom or syndrome or IC, they, some of them are very heavy focused, but like it is very individualized. But like you said, removing some of those triggers, those common bladder irritants or bowel irritants can really help with those symptoms. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. And once you, once you identify it, you're like, oh, okay. If I just watch what I eat there, or if I know I'm going to, going to get me lighter, you just having that awareness of yourself is so important. 100%. It, it's going to save you for a lot of other things because inflammation 
foods that cause inflammation in the body wreak havoc on your whole body system. So it's just a good thing to learn. Um, Lisa, tell people where they can connect with you and how, if they want to learn more and maybe they're struggling with um, really painful cycles or getting back in shape after they've had a baby, like how can they get a hold of you? So um, I have an Instagram account. I'm pretty active on it. It's lisa.pelvichealth.ot. Um, our website is genesispt.wellness.com. Um, I do have a LinkedIn as well. I think Jane is going to um, post it in the bio as, and everything. Um, so yeah, feel free to DM me there. Um, I'm gonna, I have an email address that's on my website as well. I mean, whatever is easiest to get a hold of. I check my phone pretty regularly. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to post all of that in the show notes. So all you guys have to do is go click the link and you'll be there. And by the way, she has a beautiful Instagram account. I was kind of stalkering it before we got on the call. And there's <laughs> lots of amazing information. It's like one of those uh, Instagram accounts that I call, it looks like somebody lives there. I can tell that a real person is behind that. You know, like they're engaging with the people who show up instead of someone who just has a company posting a ton of stuff to be active. So she lives there. You guys can show up and visit her, reach out to her. Well, Lisa, thank you so <laughs> much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a blast. Thanks for listening to the Oh My Health There Is Hope podcast. Make sure to visit Jana's website, bestholisticlife.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or listen there so you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you simply tell a friend about the show, that'll help too. Let's change the world together, one health expert at a time. Looking forward to seeing you next time.